All right, well, thank you guys for letting me talk to you. Stephanie's at home, and I'm going to be um, presenting about collision free motion planning um, using rapidly expanding random trees. Um, just a bit of background about myself I'm a third year PhD working with Stephanie and Michael um, on robotics and on AI. So, a lot of the problems you have seen, we sort of take them and uh, make them a lot bigger and think about them in a more complicated space. So, the problem of collision free motion planning, or I should actually st step back. So uh, many years ago, like back in the old sci-fi days, like uh, we used to think of AI as like there'll be one solution that will solve all our problems of robotics. Um, and in reality, that was um, pretty infeasible. As you guys have seen, there's many different like um, optimal solutions for different problems. Uh, and so on the robot, there are a ton of different problems that we have to solve. Um, and uh, one of them is just how you move an arm from one place to another without hitting objects along the way. Uh, I thought it was actually kind of funny. This is Robbie the Robot. Everybody, he was like in many different TV shows, many different movies. Um, many people know him from Lost in Space. I know him from The Twilight Zone, because um, that's my favorite sci-fi show. Uh, he's got like really stubby arms, which was like totally impractical. Whereas like nowadays, like real robots have like actually long arms, uh, so they can reach a larger um, amount of space. So uh, motion plotting, this is a scene from like a automo automation factory. Um, there's tons of different robots. They have to move um, around one another. They collide with like objects in the environment. Uh, it's uh, generally like a really difficult problem because not only do you have to solve for the position of the end effector, you also have to solve how to get from point A to point B um, without hitting anything or without hurt hitting people and also satisfying your joint velocity, torque, acceleration constraints, um, limits, all those sorts of plans. So uh, to give you guys some definitions that we use in uh, robotics, um, a workspace is basically all the positions that like a robot can reach. Um, it's just like an XYZ location. Um, for example, this laptop's in my workspace. Uh, Kevin is not in my workspace, uh, just X, Y, Z. However, uh, we also have to think about the configuration space. This is not just X, Y, Z, but also roll, pitch, yaw of an end effector. Um, basically, roll is about the X axis, uh, yaw is about the Y, and Z is about, yaw is about the Z, pitch is about the Y, um, roll is about the X. Uh, so that's six degrees of freedom where a degree of freedom is just a controllable parameter in configuration space. Um, but that's just talking about the arm. Uh, if you also consider a movable robot uh, like the beam, there's also um, X, Y, and rotation on the base as well. So you can have uh, many different degrees of freedom when you're trying to plan a move. Um, the, the difficulty of planning a move is not just like the arm, but also how to navigate with my arms like across a room. Say I'm carrying a basket and I have to like go up over my laptop and like put it down. Uh, that requires uh, planning over not just like where the arm's going to go, but where the robot itself is going to go as well. And then um, joint space is sort of all the possible um, locations that a joint is going to go. Uh, so. Um, or this is uh, for all the joint angles uh, for each individual joint. And so um, instead of thinking about x, y, z, roll, pitch, yaw, we just think about you know, theta of this angle, theta of this angle, you know, theta 2, theta 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. cetera. Um, and it turns out that's a lot easier to plan through because you uh, don't have to always work backwards from like, the point of the end effector back to like the shoulder joints. Instead, if you just plan through the joint, the joint angle space, uh, you can do um, what's called forward kinematics, where we map the joint angles to a configuration pose. Uh, so if you assume that your uh, arm is at uh, many different angles, uh, you basically want to take those angles and compute the end effector of pose. Um, so you have one arm to two arms the three arms, uh, the angles, you have like theta one, theta, why am I drawing Q? Uh, theta two, 
and theta 3. You know, you can imagine you just do the trigonometry of all these little triangles uh, to get like the end effector pose up here. Uh, so if this is x, this is y. The angle here is a tan of y over x, right? Uh, so the actual position is just um, tan of this times x, you know, or times the, sorry, yeah. Anyway, I think you understand. Um, it would be uh, cosine for x, it would be sine for y um, against the height. Ah, anyway, uh, okay. Am I going too fast? Like, I feel like I'm, all right, yeah, <laughs> all right. Uh, so we'll talk about the last one, inverse kinematics. So say you have an end effector pose, how do you get the joint angles? So again, if we look at the picture, uh, to go backwards and like compute this angle is an inverse tan like function. And so if you have six degrees of freedom all the way out here, you have to take the inverse of an inverse of an inverse. Uh, and then that's also, that's intractable or it's not generally easily computable. Um, instead, you have to do iterative methods that approximate a solution. Um, the interesting thing about inverse kinematics is this is something that we do really easy as people, uh, but this was a hard problem to solve in robotics. And it actually uh, continues to inform kind of how we go about solving this issue. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, we can't just always solve things in the configuration space, we actually solve things in the joint space because that's easier because of this issue right here. Um, just always going backwards is difficult. Uh, why is it hard to go backwards? Like, why is that calculation hard? Well, so if you think about it, um, like, all right, so if we just had one link, say this is like a, uh, little dumb robot, there's some joint that like can move uh, in one angle and then there's some arm and you have like your gripper out here. This angle here is tangent negative one of like the position that you want to move to. Now Say we didn't have like two links, or we didn't have one, but we had two. First, you need to compute like what, like, okay, so this angle here, tan negative one of y over x, is only good if like this angle is already computed but you don't know what this angle is. And so you have to, because that also depends on where this one's gonna be. And so going backwards is not really like an easy thing to close form solve. Um, and imagine if you had like six degrees of freedom, that problem becomes more complicated. Um, and actually there are many non-unique uh, formulations of joints. Uh, so, in this case, if you wanted to solve for the same end effector pose, you could also have your arm go down this way. Um, and that only gets worse as you have more joints. And so there's many non-unique solutions, and instead you want to find one that works for you. And actually this also uh, presents another issue in um, um, arm movement, is as you uh, move your arm, you don't want your joints flipping from like this position to this position, what we call elbow up and elbow down, uh, because suddenly like you might rotate your arm over and dump over like the cup in your hand. Um, and so as you solve like a joint a move, um, you want the joint positions to actually sort of stay similar. Um, that's convenient with inverse kinematics because a lot of the solvers are iterative. So if you plug in the solution for a point nearby, you can sort of get closer and like keep your uh, same joint or use the previous solution to solve your new joint angles. 
Uh, but if you want to learn more about inverse kinematics and forward kinematics, um, that's probably more covered in uh, CS 148, um, which is a course taught by Chad Jenkins, um, who does great work, work in robotics. And it's generally a fun course if you guys haven't taken it yet. Uh, you had a question, Carly. Yeah. Uh, so, the different rights that we have for the robots, like the differential and the right cycle kind of rights, so they come into the forward kinematics. Right? So, the different types of drives, you mean? You're right. So does that come in forward kinematics? Uh, so you're asking how to solve a position using a non-holonomic -hol robot? OK. Intra good topic. So the beam is what we call a non-holonomic robot, whereas we are holonomic. So what does that mean? My poor eraser. Um, all right, so you have all positions x and y. And you have a robot out here that needs to get to some position. Um, if the beam is pointed this way, it can't just move straight there, right? It has to sort of drive around and like as it turns. Or it could turn in place and move. But it can't immediately just sidestep its way there. Whereas you and me, we can. In fact, the PR2 is a, um, like a robot that we have downstairs that also can move in holonomic space. I think you guys have seen videos of that, right? The PR2? Yeah. The one that baked? Uh, yes, that's the one that baked last or Tuesday. Uh, you saw it like sidestep al along the kitchen. Uh, so back to your question. An example of non-holonomic is when you parallel park a car. Yeah. You can't just pull it next to this parking spot and then you know, move sideways into the spot, you have to do the parallel parking maneuver to, to get into this parking spot. So you're gonna, your wheels can't just turn and make you go directly in. Uh, so back to your question about how do you solve for uh, holonomic or non-holonomic constraints, uh, it's actually, uh, you can always get, you know, a position of where it goes, but the path plan uh, is not easily computable through uh, configuration space because you know, your pose here can't be inferred from here unless you have a good model of how you can do things. However, in joint space when talking about a non-holonomic arm, uh, that is more easily solved. Um, and we'll actually get to why. Good questions, good questions. Keep asking them. OK. So come on, video. I might have to bring these up manually. OK. Never let people see your desktop, I guess. Um, OK, so if we think about um, how we can move an arm from one position to another, um, does anybody have any like, good ideas of how we may like, incrementally move our arm from like, point A to point B? Just like, without thinking about collisions, without thinking like, just how you might get from like, the soda can to your mouth. So, yes. Um, when you say movement space, do you mean configuration space? Like your positions? Yeah. Okay. That's a good solution. And in fact, uh, there are many people who do that because it helps you like, move linearly in space. So you can move in a Cartesian position if you're always doing the inverse kinematics along a move. Um, that's very important if you have like, very constrained moves. Um, that require like a really specific path. Um, but you can also do this uh, through joint space. Um, so let me bring up this movie. Um, uh, 
where uh, nah. Probably Yeah, this is always my problem with taking movies on the iPhone, is that like some programs automatically flip it, some don't. Uh, eh, it's not regular. Yeah, there must be some issue about presenting on a second display where Mac doesn't want to show my movies um, because it for sure was working. We've got good pattern recognition. We can probably still understand it upside down. All right. Thank you, VLC. Uh, so what I'm doing here is this is just a move in, uh, actually, this is a move in joint space. I want to repeat. What happened to repeat? Um, so what I did was I computed the inverse kinematics over here and the inverse kinematics over here. And I basically just linearly interpolated all the joint positions and just had it kind of move through uh, position A to position B. And that works great, but of course, Baxter can't see this can here. Um, and so it collides. You guys all know what Baxter is? This guy, yeah. <laughs> Made by Rethink. Uh, anyway, it's a robot that we just got uh, downstairs to uh, help us with research. And so collisions, of course, are like a really bad thing um, because people may be in the way. <laughs> <laughs> That was supposed to be more spontaneous, but, you know, <laughs> PDFs. <laughs> uh, where did it, okay, that's going to be a problem. So. One, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll just load up these other ones, too, so we can go back to them. Uh, all right, so what was I actually doing? Um, Oh, yeah, of course. Thank you. Oh, wait. My picture didn't show up. That's what was going on. Um, all right, I'll just write this out. So after solving the inverse kinematics, um, we had some end effector pose here, and we had another one here. Uh, and so instead of solving every inverse kinematics point along here, um, you can always just tell your joints to like divide up this angle and kind of go through it um, until you like reach this point. And so you're, and so this becomes like a vector of uh, joint angles. Now, um, I realized I sort of missed a point here. The reason why you want to like chop this up into many different points is uh, when it comes down to arm control, uh, your controllers have to apply inputs um, at many different points along this path to get an arm to get to its position. Um, the torque at angles have to um, basically be recomputed at each point. Uh, there's not as you can imagine, a single linear function, you might just throw your motor controller and tell it to apply in this case. Um, you have to sort of check your update at many different points. Uh, so that's uh, sorry, um, why you might want to um, divide your path into many different trajectory points. <coughs> All right, so the videos are working, but the picture didn't show up. Um, so now path planning um, is this issue of how we get from point A to point B without like uh, hitting any obstacles. Um, where 
Like we want to solve for many different constraints, uh, and in this case, uh, he's not taking the most optimal path, but um, he gets to be maybe perhaps maximizing some other cost function. Yeah. Oh, this is ridiculous. Man, never use Adobe products. Okay, uh, so this was uh, just an example of a robot moving through joint space. It's um, taking many different points um, because it's only rotating around one different axis. Uh, this is not going to show the videos, but that's okay because it shows pictures, I think. Um, so now we sort of introduce this concept of uh, rapidly expanding random trees. Uh, I just gave away the punchline. So the uh, problem is that like, when we're trying to compute things through configuration space, there's a lot of different uh, things you have to calculate, and you also have to do the inverse kinematics. But now, say you want to move from position A to position B without hitting the can or without hitting a person. How do you plan around that? Um, you guys have learned many different AI techniques for search and planning. Um, but what, so, all right, so before we get to uh, RRTs, um, what are like some of the search and planning algorithms you've already learned in this class? Just because I haven't been to lecture. You're going to have to remind me. Somebody raise their hand. A star. A star. Breath first search. Breath first search. MDP. Value at rate. RMAX. Yeah, RMAX. All right. Do you notice anything common about the problems you're solving with all these homework projects, with all these uh, situations? Yeah, they're all 2D state spaces. So what happens when you get to 3D? Or when you get to 6D because uh, you have roll pitch and yada to plan over as well? Exactly. So your typical search algorithms, though they may find you the best path, are just impractical in like any continuous space, no matter how you discretize it. Um, it's just way too large to search over, especially if you also have to add in collision checking and uh, path constraints of making sure your hand is uh, you know, always in the same orientation or that you never arrive and like, or that you arrive at the time that you mean to, these problems just become intractable. Your computer is just going to stall on them forever. And so we need a sampling-based technique that uh, actually can um, sort of compute this. And before I get into RRTs, actually, um, there's one more way we can think about this, and that's called a probabilistic roadmap. So uh, you guys all remember configuration space, right? X, Y, Z, roll pitch, yaw of an end effector. And um, we can basically panning or planning from like point A to point B, if we have some weird configuration space and we have some obstacles in the way, basically the probabilistic roadmap will just like find you know, and then maybe something big here. It'll like choose a bunch of different points. Um, in configuration space. And then it'll throw out all the ones that uh, collide with something. And then it'll just make a graph and search over this graph. Uh, so 
So when I'm connecting these lines, this basically means that there is an easily computable plan. Like basically it can just move like linearly interpolating points. It can like go from this point and just like march along here to this point. That's basically what I mean when I'm saying it can plan from like here to here. And so the plan overall from like maybe you're starting out here to going out here is just going to take the lowest cost plat path through this grid. Can anybody tell me issues that you may think of uh, when like trying to plan through configuration space? Back there. Yeah, so uh, if for some reason you didn't choose enough points, your, point, your path can like go straight through your obstacles. And so you solve that by you know, doing a lot more points. Uh, but then uh, that leads into another problem. All right, so maybe there's too many points or not enough. If there's enough obstacles in the way, it's suboptimal in terms of your search. If you're having to go around something that you want to do. Okay, sure. Um, it's not going to give you like the most direct path, maybe. Obstacles move. Uh, they for sure move, uh, <laughs> but that's a problem that we're going to not consider right now uh, because there are different solutions to that. That aren't quite solved by these algorithms. I'm oh, sorry, question? When, yeah. when you're actually constructing the graph from the non-collided points, do you have access to knowledge about where the, the objects that you can collide with are? Or, so like, why didn't you connect like in the top right and the, yeah, there's two, it's like the two points at the very top. Do you, do you, do you know that there's a collision if you follow? Yeah, because you're basically going to try to march along here and see, hey, can I plan this? No, I can't. But the reason why you don't just like do that from here to here is because your state space, again, is too large. But maybe you can break it up into like small little increments that are more feasible. Uh, so one of the big problems of like this approach goes back to the issue of forward kinematics versus inverse kinematics. This is in uh, configuration space. You're choosing feasible positions all along the way, but every single point in here, you have to compute the inverse kinematics of where these things are. Uh, and so that, again, becomes difficult as like, your degrees of freedom increase. Uh, and so instead, we would love to plan through joint space, um, which uh, there you only have to compute forward kinematics to kind of uh, solve everything. Do you need to get the, full, the inverse kinematics of every point, or only every end point that you decide to path through? Because if like the top left point we never decide we're going to path through, then would we ever need to know what joint angles we'd have to plan through? Oh, is it because of the planning thing? Um, yeah, never mind. Yeah, so yeah, you're going to have to figure out like what's the distance and right, to, to yeah, the yeah. Right. Okay. So instead, like if we sort of map this world into joint space, uh, that's a much better sort of way to plan through because then we don't have to add in the inverse kinematics. Um, and so the, um, and anyway, so uh, we can do that. Uh, it doesn't, we can do that using uh, rapidly expanding random trees um, where instead of um, just computing a bunch of different points and basically uh, trying to connect them all. Uh, we start with some initial point, x in it, and we extend our tree from there on. Um, so sort of the base level algorithm, like you find, you initialize your tree with just like your starting point, you pick some random point all along joint space, uh, and then you extend in the direction of that random point. You don't go quite all the way to that random point, you only march along that way. Um, and so extend, um, basically what we're going to do is we're going to add in 
we're going to find, you know, if x is our random point, uh, we're going to find the nearest point on our tree and march in the direction of x by some epsilon um, number. Epsilon and delta t here are the same. And then we add in an x new, like just our new position along the tree. And then we add in another point, and we kind of just keep updating our tree. And so the great thing about doing this in joint space um, and why like, we can use uh, trees in joint space is that uh, you're only having to collect or uh, you're only having to compute collisions uh, as you go along. Um, and so uh, you don't have to do inverse kinematics. It saves you a lot. Um, okay, so. All right, oh, just a note about collision detection. Um, assume that like using a connect, I think Stephanie mentioned connects like last week or laser scanners, you get some 3D buildup of your environment. And if there's some object that you might want to choose, um, say this one right here, uh, you need to sort of efficiently sort of store all your collision data. And so I don't know, have people here taken uh, intro to graphics? One person. So, yeah, one of the, like, the great ways of storing and doing collision detection and graphics is sort of similar here, is the use of uh, octrees. Um, so we call this thing on the right here an octomap because it maps points in your space to uh, collision points. And so basically how you're going to um, sort of do this collision detection is that if you have a bunch of points uh, and then, you know, that you might want to avoid colliding with, you divide it into bounding boxes, lots and lots of bounding boxes, where you just divide it in half and then again and again and again and again and again. Um, so that if your arm is moving through, say, down here, and it's going to try to plan through all this path, you can check, you know, does it collide with this box? No? OK, I can discard all those collision checks. I don't have to worry about this. Uh, and so then you just do that in here. And then you like, keep iterating through. So that's more of a logarithmic collision check. Um, and then furthermore, it's constant if you're not colliding with anything, right? So um, that's like a very efficient way. And um, on robots, this is kind of what our collision map looks like. Uh, any guesses as to what this object may be? It's very voxely. No. Soda All right, so the soda can's in front. What's in the back? Computer. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, now we get to see some pretty demos. I need my chair again for this. Um, for the homework, uh, Miles has uh, sort of cooked up a program to get you guys to implement basically extend method of uh, RRTs. And so um, okay. um, this is kind of exactly what uh, your result of your homework is going to look like. Uh, this is code produced by the guy who invented uh, RRTs. And basically, it's going to start in some place and expand your tree outward until it finds your goal point. Um, this is only 2D, of course, but um, these are, this is kind of what an RRT looks like. Does anybody notice any issues with this? Exactly. Like, you know where your goal is. Why do you need, like, one directional? Um, so, or I should say, why can't you just, like, converge straight on it? Um, so, if you see your goal, can't you just, like, connect straight to it? You had a question. Um, is your goal something in the space or in the space? Well, your start and your goal actually exist in both. Um, you computed the inverse kinematics for your start and the end. And so you know where they exist in both places. Uh, and so you're just going to plan through them both. Um, 
Yeah, so what if you could just like basically once you find like a connection, jump straight there and then just like quit. Like you sort of basically this extends like the RRT. Um, this is getting beyond what your homework is asking you to do. I would love it if you guys like played around with sort of made your own like optimal add in new like collisions in this little game. This is using Pygame, so it's pretty easy to add in like new collisions and whatnot. Um, but basically this um, adds in a step where instead of adding a node every single time to like search out this point, um, instead it just sort of gets close and then once it sees the point, it like jumps to it and it's like, hooray, I can get there. Um, so this sort of shows issues here. Where do you think um, this RRT with connect might have trouble? Can you guys think of like any specific formulations of uh, obstacles where this might actually like take a long time to solve? Do we need to go through like multiple small holes? Okay, yes. Is the small hole not pointing directly towards it if it's oriented in another direction? For instance, if, it, if it's enclosed on all sides except for the opposite side from the goal? Yeah, so, um, right, why, like, why is it, if it's pointing away from the goal, have a bigger effect on like whether this tree gets to this point versus whether it just like goes straight there? Like why doesn't the tree sort of expand out like conveniently this way and, and get there? I don't know if that question was clear enough. All right, so we have our world. Sorry, folks at home, if you're listening closely. <laughs> Is the audio still good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you have your obstacles. Um, you have some goal, and your tree is expanding out this way. Like... <laughs> Why, all right, so let's compare this situation versus this one. Where maybe the goal is not like right in the funnel, but it's close by. And then your tree starts out here and expands this way, you know, expands randomly. Why might this one take longer to reach the goal than this one. You see from the wall sort of direct it to the funnel of any way that it get away from it. Like if you miss it in this in the one to the side, it'll sort of take it sideways. So it's gonna push it in the Yeah, so it's all random, right? Like you're selecting random points sort of uniformly across like your space. And so if your tree, when it like, if a point is up here, it's gonna ask for the nearest neighbor to this tree. And if that is on this side down here, then like it's gonna try to extend this way. And so it's not really gonna like find that funnel, like this hole, until it like randomly gets over here. And so if this funnel is like particularly troublesome, uh, the amount of random points that can pull the tree this way it would be pretty small. Whereas in this case, kind of all these points here are going to pull a tree this way. And then likewise, like if they're here, they're pulling the tree like that way. Yeah. So um, maybe just a clarification of how you extend it. Sure. So uh, there are many different kind of ways of implementing extend. Um, and I think like the vanilla version of RRT just like says, can I move? No, don't move it. But um, there are many others which like 
will sort of march along that direction as far as it can go. So if it like comes here, it'll add a new node there. Um, and so you do get close to obstacles, but that actually doesn't really solve your problem here. All right, so somebody mentioned what makes RRT connect hard is if you have multiple of those, what are called bug traps. Um, like, all right, that one was pretty quick. But uh, in general, like, it's going to be hard for points to, you know, draw this tree in here. Kind of once it does, though, then it, like, rapidly, like, explores the space. Um, it's all random, right? So you don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, there's some great mathematical, you know, theory about uh, kind of how quickly it can, like, expand the spaces or given how much time is it going to, you know, take to reach this spot. Uh, <laughs> All right. Can anybody think of another improvement we can make to deal with that problem? You have trees starting at points. Yeah, bidirectional. Uh, so. That's called bidirectional RRTs. And so that one doesn't have the problem because it finds the funnel. And they, like, basically, uh, they're not trying to connect, like, start. They're just trying to, like, every time they add a node, connect with one another. Um, and so that actually, like, works pretty well with, like, these sorts of bug traps. Uh, it's going to do a similar nearest neighbor thing where it says, all right, I added a node to tree, tree A. Can I connect to that node from tree B? All right, I added a node to tree B. Can I connect to that from tree A? I'll um, get more into that in a little bit. But I mean, yeah, they're trying to like greedily connect with one another. Um, all right. so. Where, what sort of situations can you imagine to make bidirectional RRTs hard? You have those angles like pointing the opposite direction and you have a zero on them? Yeah, you do your bug traps in the opposite way. And then also you have to like put a little divider there. I don't know. It's hard to make it hard. Um, because like it's going to take a while for them to like start expanding, um, but also for them to see one another, you sort of block it, and like the trees just uh, sort of keep expanding until eventually one peeks through and it's you know yay. All right, who's betting on the bottom one? Who's betting on the top? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things that you do with uh, RRTs is that it's always a for loop to like the maximum number of nodes. So it's like from one to k, you know, don't go beyond that. Uh, you don't kind of just do while true because like there's no guarantee that this will find your solution in some amount of time. Oh, it's so close at the top. Did I just give up? I gave up. <laughs> Come on, you can see it. Yes. All right. <laughs> That's too exciting. So that's the code you're going to play around with. Um, it is available, I believe, already. Um, you know. You have to implement the nearest neighbor. You have to do a lot of the extend portion. Um, but it, you know, have fun with it. Try to make your best version of trees that you can. Uh, so kind of the bidirectional, we are talking about this briefly. Uh, you're going to have two trees now, TA and TB, 
where you initialize one with like your uh, start state and you initialize the other one with a goal state and you choose a random state and you add it to TA if that is not like if the tree can actually extend that way then you try to extend your tree B to that new node and if so then you're done um, and then you swap which node you add to TA and TB Yeah. So not just two trees, but like n trees. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely a good way to you know solve many more path constraints. Um, whether it in the real world uh, provides you any like at least in terms of uh, uh, joint planning, it's not really like the case that you always come up with many different bug traps so that might not be like that gain of much but it certainly is like a solution if you have a lot of like bug trap situations all right uh, so the videos um, So this is the robot actually using a connect. It sees the laptop and the can. And it's just trying to go, it's trying to move its position around here. Um, and so this is using sort of, it's not my implementation. It's like this huge library of code that like does path planning of arms like pretty intelligently. Um, and it sort of connects a path from like point A to point B using um, a sort of this random tree approach. So, uh, I don't know. Anybody notice anything weird about this? Uh, yeah, it's like kind of inefficient. Um, but do we care about that? Like in some cases, maybe not. Like you, like this is my laptop. I don't want the robot getting near it. Um, so, all right. Uh, and there were more hands. I don't know. Anybody notice anything else? Yeah, it's, it's what you might call high energy. Like, it requires a lot more effort than is necessary. Uh, so what about, like, thinking about trees and trying to connect? What is this doing that the trees aren't doing, though? Like what's missing between our bidirectional RRT and perhaps like what this guy is doing as it moves around my objects, my laptop. It's my laptop, right? Like it's an expensive piece of machinery. Only I can like treat it poorly. Yeah, like when it can. It doesn't want to get close to them. Uh, anybody notice anything else? So notice like the difference between like our trees. I mean, you guys already mentioned that like this looks already like pretty high, you know, cost in terms of like unnecessary movements. But think about like all these jagged edges. Do you see jagged edges on like this robot? It has to smooth it somehow, right? Um, so like once it's found a, like a path from like point A to point B, uh, there's got to be I don't know a way to smooth out your path so that you don't like collision check or so that you don't collide again. And then, of course, because <laughs> the funny thing about making this video, so somebody mentioned that like if an object gets in the way, you need to like plan around it. 
I had to stay absolutely still so that like this software library was not like, holy crap, what's going on? Like somebody's in the way. Uh, so that's why like I am very careful because as soon as the connect saw me move, like it would just stop moving the joint. Uh, okay. So we already mentioned some issues about what's mo or like what's missing. Um, it's very jagged, like it's not that smooth. It's you know that's avoiding obstacles like very carefully in that, but not using RRTs. Uh, if, you, if you know the configuration space already, like you know, uh, only the things that are cleaning are the obstacles. Right? So can we have a set of nodes which form the old map so that we can always face So um, you have a set of nodes that you're so first, already connected. Now, first, I don't have any nodes. Yeah. So I do the RRT. Yeah. To the goal. Okay. But when I replace, I can uh, set some of them as nodes, and when I'm having a different problem or a different goal, I can just go to these nodes. Because you've already found that they don't collide. Um, that's. Sure, that might be fair, but do you ever start from the same position again to like go to an like you always have to move back to where you're originally going to. So I don't know if you'd ever be reusing many of the same points again. But I mean, yeah, sure. Um collision checks are generally reused a lot in Ross, I believe. Um because like you know your gripper is not gonna collide with your foot, so don't bother checking that after a while. Like, or you know your gripper is not going to collide with this object, like way over here. You don't need to check that again. Um, so our trees, the motion generated would be very jerky. We talked about that. Um, it, the tree itself actually generates like longer paths than uh, optimal. Um, the tree itself is going to closely approach approach objects, but we found that like that's not quite ideal. Um, and then the last part is like it's constraint unaware. Like um, you know, it just found a solution through joint space to get from one position to another. But if we're carrying a cup of water, if the robot's carrying a cup of water, you don't want it like spinning like it did. Um, and so what I didn't show in those videos is that you can also plan uh, specific constraints as well. Um, and so I just wanted to touch briefly on kind of how you might solve each of these problems. Um, so if our tree is like really jagged, But we ended up finding a goal. You know, we get there. Um, how might you like smooth this out? Like compute if there's like a more direct path between the parts that got the collide or anything. Between the start and the goal? No, like between these parts that got the collide. Sure. Yeah. So if you take this point and this point, you know, can we move here? If you take this point and this point, can we move there? And that's called node rejection, where like as we go through, we just like smooth them out. All right. Um, now, if we think about the issue of closely approaching objects, where you know laptop is over here, uh, how might you like? But your path obviously went like right by it. It like skirted right by the laptop. Um, I don't know. Is there like a sort of easy way you might clean this up? Yeah. So that's a good. Um, that's always like uh, an approach is just put some buffer space around your object. 
so that there's always like a guaranteed path. But what happens if like you're trying to navigate through a tight space? Um, like if I'm trying to move my hand kind of like through here, uh, like that would be deemed impossible if we put the buffer space, um, which solves your problem, but it also um, can be over optimistic or over pessimistic sometimes. Um, maybe there's a slightly different thing we can do so that we still find the path. Uh, sure, um, if you had like an object, um, but you're talking like position and configuration space? Yeah. yeah. So, all right, that's close, that's close, actually. Go for it, yeah. A heuristic, yeah. <laughs> we like heuristics in the class. So uh, I think this is similar to what she said. You like uh, just put like a barrier that's larger than your object, um, but that may be over pessimistic, right? So uh, something actually between these two versions is like having uh, attractors and repellers. So if you assume that like this object is just like heavily repulsive um, and then this one too is like heavily repulsive, like it's going to find that average point between the two um, and it's also going to try to skirt away. Uh, it's probably how you might uh, approach that problem as well. Okay. Uh, and then it was brought up, the mention about heuristics. So if you were to combine perhaps A star with RRT, you get RRT star. Uh, and this is sort of a diagram of what that might look like, um, where for each like, node in your tree, this is a little bit small, I'll redraw it up there. Um, So with each heuristic, there's a notion of cost. Um, so in our case, cost may be like path lengths through joint space. Um, so we have a bunch of nodes that are already connected. That's not quite a tree. Um, and if we want to add a new node, kind of what this graph is showing, um, Oh, by the way, we have our goal state and our end state over here. Um, like, say we added a node uh, here. Its nearest neighbor would be this one right here, correct? So we first attach it, but then we look at like the nearest neighbors around here. And we say, can we make this path from goal to end any shorter by adding this new node? And in which case, yeah, you certainly can. Um, you would delete that link and attach that one. Uh, and that would help like, sort of guide your search down this way. Of course, like, you know, as with heuristics, like, there's many different heuristics you can design that like, might solve one problem better than another. Um, but this is certainly like a, by using the cost between nodes, um, you can like relink your graph together to like expand that way. If somebody does that in their Python code, I'll, anyway. Uh, <laughs> all right, so I think that actually sort of concludes all that I have. Um, was there any like more follow up about kind of what I've talked about? Um, I don't know if I've like added a bunch of confusion about joint space, configuration space, RRTs, roadmaps. Could you take a like what another version was to what he said in which for 
if like you were talking about like a star make your heuristic give you negative reward if like your distance to the object be uh, give you some sort of negative reward such that you try and avoid it but if it's the only way to go you'll choose it even though it's like a huge negative reward because you have to go through that path yeah um and you hope that your planner finds that out and if that's the case and you're like really close to some object maybe you just like slow down and what's how is how is this in real life practice wise the speed like how long does the robot have to like stare at the table before it starts planning yeah uh what are planning terms like just because like all the videos are moving yeah i cut it off <laughs> Uh, so let's see. I might give you an uncut version. Like, is it still a field? Like, it's not like solved yet. Point nope. Okay. Uh, so first you have to start the robot. You have to put on your props. Uh, I have a mouse in my right hand, and I'm just about to click, like, go. And so, I don't know. I guess we're not going to see, like, when I actually click it. Oh, that's where I moved, and it actually, like... There's another laptop on the ground that I'm like actually connected to this robot. Uh, so I mean, to answer your question, like the connect give us like information at like 30 hertz. Um, the com computation of like a collision map uh, probably takes on the order of like a second. Um, planning through this space uh, can take like anywhere from a fraction of a second to like five or ten seconds. I think we max out our planner at about 20 seconds. Um, but yeah, like, that's a long time if you have to like right. make that's many different time. moves. Yeah. Like, you certainly would not see that in that um, industrial factory case. Like, all those robots aren't collision checking. They're just pre-programmed to move from like point A to point B. Right. Garlic. About gimbal lock? All right. So uh, we talked briefly about like forward and inverse kinematics in the beginning. Um, there's sort of an issue that can arise um, where if like your joints are all orthogonal to one another, you go through like what's called a singularity point, where basically in order to get through here, um, I'm trying to think of like what a uh, basically, in order to like plan through a path, like all your joints have to like flip around really quickly, um, and so I don't know what more I can say about that, but that's just like. Uh, How do we upload that in RFP? Oh, well, hmm. I don't think I have a good solution to that. I mean. You can certainly like try to avoid that because you know where that is in joint space. You can just like stay away from this point. You know, repel myself from this point. Um, that yeah, because like as you get close to your singularity, the joint velocities required like approach infinity to like do that move in any constrained amount of time. Um, so yeah, you might try to like just propel yourself away from that. Uh, you might think of it as like a Gaussian, I mean, you know, magnetics repel with like a Gaussian distribution. So do you just um, like choose a point and then check it based on the Gaussian distribution or how do you, like, when, yeah. when does that step of whether it's near my track or repeller? So, I mean, imagine that like you have uh, some function.
or some uh, obstacle here that has some, you know, it's has some like Gaussian uh, propulsion away from there, and you have a node. Basically, what it's going to do is like uh, repel this with like a certain amount of force or distance, um, such that like points here are like I don't know, so it like pushes it away. Uh, that is not a great answer. So, so like you choose the point and then the point that you chose gets moved and then you check it with its relative to the tree? Uh, no, the post-processing step of like cleaning up close to the collisions is already once you found a path. Okay. You know, it's like, oh, I found this great path and oh no, it takes me by the laptop. All right. Uh, if there are no more questions, thank you guys for attending. Um. <laughs> Hope you guys learned some stuff.